You're listening to the RN Mentor, a podcast designed to document and bring you the work and experience of some of the most influential nurses in our profession. We will be sitting down and having a discussion with the leaders of today's nursing world as they share their work, how they navigate their nursing path, and their views on the future of the profession. My name is Ali Tayeb. I am a registered nurse, United States Navy veteran, a Jonas Veterans Healthcare Scholar, and your host for the RN Mentor. Today on the RN Mentor Podcast, we have Dr. Richard Ricciardi. He is the current president of Sigma Theta Tau International, professor and director of strategic partnership for Center for Health, Policy, and Media Engagement at George Washington University School of Nursing, and a 30-year Army veteran. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another podcast of the RN Mentor. Uh, So welcome, Dr. Ricciardi. Thanks, Ali. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Uh, so really, I wanted to start with uh, sort of your, your beginning from uh, where you started in the world of nursing. How, what, you know, uh, what, what brought you into nursing? Oh, well, I do have a funny story there that perhaps you might like to hear. Um, I was one of those kids. I, I grew up in New York City. Uh, my parents were immigrants. Uh, and, I, you know, I love city life. I'm an urban uh, I don't want to say I'm an urban legend. That would that's not true. But <laughs> I, I, I uh, we grew up in the streets of New York, really, and you know it was uh, it was it was the '60s, and uh, it was a different time. And uh, you know, uh, so I I was very much uh, interested in school at an early age. So I'm not sure why, but my parents uh, my 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 parents were hardworking blue collar workers. My father was a construction worker. Uh, my mother was a seamstress, and she worked um, as part of the uh, a garment in- district and garment industry in New York. So I grew up, uh, you know, in a, a very modest but loving home and, you know, in a very typical neighborhood for the time in, uh, you know, in New York City with lots of friends, lots of uh, different uh, uh, ethnic groups, different uh, languages, you know, all around me. And, uh, you know, we, but we all had a good time together. You know, we were out and out of our parents' hair. So uh, my father at an early age, uh, you know, he he was a construction worker and he he taught me how to do a lot of stuff with my hands, how to build things, how to do bricklaying, how to, you know, do concrete and put in sidewalks and driveways and stuff. So once I started getting older in the summer, he would take, take uh, me to work. And, you know, I was an assistant, of course, on non-paid, but, you know, I learned a lot. But I think his lesson to me was, uh, since he didn't have the opportunity to go to school and he showed me what he did, I think his lesson in his subtle way that he approached it was, uh, you can either do this for the rest of your life, and if you like it, that's great. I do. I like what I do. Or you have choices in this great country we call America, where you could go to school, uh, get get, uh, an education in an area that you're very fond of, and, uh, you know, see what happens. So what happened, uh, what, what, what I was very fond in, which you, you may or may not be surprised about, was math. Um, I really was really good at it. Um, I really enjoyed it. I was one of those students in elementary and high school that, you know, would do more problems than the teacher asked me to do. You know, I'd go home and do my homework and then say, well, I'm not satisfied. I got to do more. I have to do more math problems. I'm having fun doing this, you know? So math uh, is the Achilles heel of some nurses. Uh, so it's, it's interesting. You mentioned that. <laughs> well, I loved it. And, um, and I was good at it and my brain worked that way. I don't know why, but you know, I was, I was born with that kind of, of a brain. So when I went to college and, you know, college was not, an expected thing because when, you know, when I was growing up, we didn't talk about college. I took all the exams, you know, in New York city, they had the exams to be a postal worker, to be a fireman, to be a police officer, all those sorts of things. And, you know, I took those exams and, uh, as it turns out, one of, uh, uh, one of the, of the guidance counselors in my school said, you know, you got good grades. You ought to think about going to college, you know? So, 
I applied for college along with taking all those exams, and I got accepted at, at the time. The city university in New York uh, was free for, for students. So I got accepted to go to a couple of city universities, and I chose to go to Hunter College, which is in Manhattan, downtown Manhattan, midtown Manhattan. I'm sorry, midtown Manhattan. And uh, I studied math. Okay, and that's what I applied mathematics, as much math as I could consume. Of course, I had to take some of the other courses like, you know, literature, which I liked. Um, and I really enjoy the arts and literature, but, you know, my primary mission. So when I got to be a senior in, in, at university, I started looking for jobs. I'm thinking, well, I can be a math teacher in high school. That's what I kind of wanted to do. And uh, I applied for some jobs and I couldn't get any. Um, at the time, there was a, a, big, uh, a big affirmative action initiative going on in, in the uh, public system and most of the public jobs in New York. And being a white male was not uh, something that was uh, being sought after uh, with, all, uh, you know, with all the interest in, in trying to diversify the workforce, which I fully support and I think is a great thing. So uh, opportunities uh, didn't arise for me in one area. However, so my first mentors were really my mom and dad. Um, and they've instilled in me uh, a terrific uh, love of life. Uh, a love of uh, under, un enjoying and uh, really uh, being gra grateful for the simple things in life, like friendships, like uh, being able to uh, meet you and have a, a podcast. <laughs> you know, those sorts of things that, uh, you know, are important in connections. Uh, and, and, you know, and, uh, and uh, just being a, 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 a kind and compassionate individual. I learned that from my parents. However, another mentor was my sister because I, talked, I was talking to my sister and I said, you know, I said, Rosemary, you know, I'm, I'm having a little bit of trouble finding a job. And she says, well, you know what? You ought to think about becoming a nurse. Wow. She was, a, she was uh, she's two years younger than me and she was getting ready to apply for nursing school. And um, I'm like, a nurse? She says, yeah, nurses like to teach. Nurses like to be around people and they're engaged with people and nursing is a science and you like science and math. I said, all right, I'm going to think about that. So on Sunday I went, I went to the library and I got out the New York times and I went to the one, you know, the job ads. And I said, I'm not going to make this mistake again. I'm not going to go into a <laughs> career and not be able to find the job. So what happens is I open this jobs galore for nurses so I went back and I said, you know what, I'm going to try this nursing out. And, you know, I, I do like people. I, you know, I, I never really thought about myself being in healthcare, But, you know, so, so I applied to nursing school and I was one of the three men in the class of 155 at Downstate in Brooklyn wow. to go to nursing school with my sister. My sister and I, we went to school, at the, you know, in the same class, same graduating class. So another mentor and I, and you know, for anyone who is interested in mentoring and what are some of the important aspects of mentoring, of course, mentoring is a two way street. And, uh, but you have to be ready and open as an individual to accept what's around you that the mentor may, may bring to you or may at least open your eyes to. Your mentor might not say to you, you know what, you should go to nursing school. But the fact is, my sister, you know, was a nurse and she said, you know, nursing's great. Think about what that is and, and at least open your mind and open your curiosity to allow for what's going on around you to, you know, penetrate you. So uh, that's an, what I think one of the important characteristics of mentor and mentorship is, is being open. So I was open and I learned from that and I went to nursing school and I graduated um, I have to say it was pretty different from what I thought it was going to be, but I liked it. So um, after I graduated from nursing school, um, I felt like I wanted to give something back to my country. So I got a direct commission into the Army. My father was a veteran of World War II, um, you know, and, you know, the, the country had embraced my family. They, or, you know, they let us come in through Ellis Island. 
You know, we had a good lives in the United States. And I, I had a very strong sense of patriotism. And I said, I'm going to, and, my, and I said to my parents, I said, you know, I really like to join the military. I want to give back to this great country. You know, I've provided with an education. And they said, you know, fine. And my sister, you know, everybody was supportive. So I joined the military thinking, you know what, I'll, I'll go in for three years uh, and think about what I want to do after that. And, uh, and I was thinking about, you know, what were my options, what I might do, what I might not do after signing up for three years. So um, I was in the military and I started, you know, I was loving nursing and I started actually liking the military, you know, the, the concept of, uh, of, you know, the, the whole concept of brothers and sisters with a, a greater uh, mission, you know, who are very much have a shared mental model on how to get the job done and, you know, coming together for the greater good. And I, I really I appreciated that philosophy. Uh, not that it wasn't hard work. Obviously, it's hard work and anything we do that's worthwhile is hard work. Um, I really uh, got involved in, there was this new profession evolving called the nurse practitioner, which had been around a little while, but very few people had really much knowledge about it. So, I, I, you know, I, the, the military, uh, all branches of the military, Army, Navy, or Air Force, are very pro-education. They really like service members, uh, whether they're enlisted service members or officers, to get educated, to go to school, to better themselves, because they're about leadership and developing leaders and strengthening leaders. So the Army had lots of opportunities for me to go to education. And, um, and they were also um, similar to what I received in my undergraduate, which was very inexpensive education that was mostly public funded. The military education is also public funded. You get to go... Uh, so I went to um, the nurse practitioner program, which was the original one, the pediatric nurse practitioner program at Fitzsimmons Army Medical Center, which is in Aurora, Colorado, which was affiliated with the first nurse practitioner program, which was started at the University of Colorado. And while I was there, I had another opportunity to meet another important mentor of mine who was one of the co-founders of the nurse practitioner movement, Dr. Henry K. Silver. And I've written a lot about Henry K. Silver. I've written uh, a tribute to him on the 50th anniversary of the nurse practitioner role. And friend, Henry and I became friends. He was a first my preceptor or a mentor in clinic, where, you know, when we started out as nurse practitioners, it was a lot different from now, Ali. Back then, nurse practitioners were taught exclusively by physicians because there weren't this cadre of nurse practitioners that could teach, you know, upcoming nurses who were interested in becoming. So all of my faculty, basically all of my teachers at becoming uh, a nurse practitioner were physicians. So I also learned at that point as, as a, as about the importance of interprofessional teams, the importance of being mentored by individuals that are outside of your respective discipline and being thoughtful in what they bring to the table in your development and the development of those around you to learn more. Uh, so it, it, it helped me as a young 22-year-old, you know, to a 21-year-old, 22-year-old to uh, be uh, mindful of not always latching on to the obvious, but trying to expand your horizons and think about what else is out there. So Henry and I became friends. And there's an interesting story around that that's related to personal relationships and mentors. When I was uh, in clinic, and uh, we used to have these things called silver pearls, Henry K. Silver and silver par pearls, uh, where Henry would provide us with these pearls of wisdom. And um, one time Henry and I, he was giving me a silver pearl which to this day I still use, I still practice as an NP in clinic. And uh, it's, it's a form of mentorship. It was, it was uh, in January. It was flu season. And back then we used to use uh, handwritten charts, right? It was before the electronic health record. And, you know, we had these little like um, sleeves on the back of our doors of the exam room 
where the medical assistants or the nursing assistants or the medics would put charts in there and they put them in order. So you would just grab a chart and see the patient. A lot different from today when you go on your screen and it tells you who's here or who's not here. So my chart, my, 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 the slot was full of charts. I had like six charts in there. The waiting room was full. There was so many people with flu coming in with influenza or, you know, et cetera, with fevers. And Henry pulls me into the preceptor room and he says, Rick, you know, throughout your professional career and practice, you're going to have many days like this. And before you go in and see that patient, I want you to go in and take, take a deep breath while you're at the door before you knock on the door to go in and say, how would you want your mother, your brother, your sister, your son, your daughter, your wife or your spouse or your loved one or your partner? He didn't say partner back then, but, you know, um, be treated by the provider that takes care of them. And I can tell you to this day, I do that every time before I walk into an exam room or before I introduce myself to someone who doesn't know me or even someone who already knows me that's coming in for follow-up if I'm having a bad day because it's really about having that interpersonal connection and treating people with kindness and dignity that they so deserve um, that, uh, and you know, being in the caring professions like we are, Ali, you know, it's, it's, it's easy to forget that, you know, you know, we can become complacent in that. And it helped me to uh, maintain a very strong uh, and mindful attitude to who's in that room, that they are a person and they're here to, you know, to, they invited me into their life. That's very how much, I look at it. Very much for the concept of, uh, I was, I tell my students uh, when I have them uh, at clinicals or uh, even in, the, in my lecture classes, I tell them where, whatever, whenever you're going to go onto the unit or you're going to go into a room, leave your baggage at the door, go into the room and be present for that individual. So great advice. I'm glad. Yeah, that's well said, Ali. <laughs> Henry did it to me in a different way. It was real time, you know, in, in real time, but it's a good way to learn too. Uh, and so Henry became a mentor and we stayed friends until he died in 1991. And if, if anyone listening to this podcast, I welcome you to read my piece on the tribute to Henry K. Silver. Very few nurse practitioners know about him. They know about Dr. Lee Ford or Loretta Ford because, you know, she's called the mother of the nurse practitioner role. She's still alive and she's still a whippersnapper. <laughs> you know, I've, I've known Dr. Ford my whole career. Um, she's a mentor also in a different way, someone who I, I really admire and look up to. Uh, but um, so moving up, and I'll, I'll move a little quicker here to just give you a little background on. Uh, then, I, Since I became a nurse practitioner, then I stayed in the Army because one of the benefits, since you're a, you are a veteran, Ali, you know that one of the beauties of being a healthcare professional in the Department of Defense is that it's a single-payer system. <laughs> Very true. Very and true. Um, it's also about teams because you don't have – since healthcare in the Department of Defense is not a business like it is in the U.S., it's not a $4.2 trillion for-profit industry like it is in the U.S., it's really about taking care of the patient. We're not making any money. It's a capitated system. You know, it's a system where – uh, U.S. taxpayers are paying for this capitation through the DOD budget, which allows for a much more um, calm approach to delivering care from the perspective is that physicians, nurses, PAs, all healthcare professionals are not competing for the almighty dollar. And I found that to be a pleasant place to practice. Which was a very strange transition for me when I came out of the military. Uh, because, you know, I was a Navy corpsman, so we just treated the patient. There was no thought around what is the cost of, you know, getting tests done or what is where the insurance is going to come from. None of that was an issue. Uh, coding, none of that happened. Uh, so it, it was a very weird transition for me going so into So you can project. fully understand how, how um, enticing it is to practice in an environment where everybody is really having a shared mental model. They're, 
They're about a patient-centered approach to care. And really, it, it doesn't matter if a physician sees the patient or a nurse or a PA sees the patient because nobody's making any money off of it. So you can actually do it from a team perspective. Who is the most qualified person or the person who has time or the person who has, you know, availability right now to see that patient? And then, you know, we work as a team. So I was very much drawn to the concept of team-based care, uh, the capitated system. So I stayed in the military. I found it to be a very rewarding uh, and both patriotic and rewarding. But, you know, since you're a service member, you know it's challenging. It puts a lot of pressures on families. You go, you have to go where you're told. Um, you have to um, meet new people along the way, you know, and you have to say goodbye to friends and make new friends. There's, there's happiness and sadness along the way. You move, you don't really have a place to establish roots for any long period of time. So there's downsides, and, you know, you have to weigh that. But for me and my family, um, it, it seemed to work for us. So I stayed in the military. Uh, I was practicing as an NP for a very long time and then decided, you know what? Managed care came in. The concept of, of uh, seeing more patients, reducing costs, which was very much going on in the private sector, it moved to the to the DOD as well, right? And I said, you know, I've been I'm a very I'm an experienced nurse practitioner. However, I don't like what I see what's happening to healthcare delivery. I need to I need to do something about that. So I uh, I got a, you know uh, I went on and got a PhD. I had a couple of master's degrees along the way through the military, but. Um, because I moved from a PNP and then I got my family nurse practitioner when I was teaching at the Uniformed Services University. I was faculty there teaching the pediatric content. And then while I was there, I, I also studied and became a family nurse practitioner wow. um, so that I was capable of taking the care of not only service members' family and their adolescent children and their young children, but the service member themselves because I felt like that's something I wanted to do. But then after that, I moved on and got a PhD because I really was interested in changing how healthcare was delivered, getting more involved in how I can inform policy and inform policy level decisions. So for my PhD, I had two very, very uh, wonderful mentors. Um, one was uh, a person named Pat, Dr. Patty Doyster, who was uh, an expert in human physiology and the concept of human performance, how humans can perform under various kinds of conditions and how the human body is affected by the external environment, by all sorts of things that we deal with uh, that, that, that can compromise how we are successful in going through our daily life. And my second mentor was uh, uh, Dr. Laura Talbot, who uh, was a nurse who was very much interested in um, the concept of strengthening your physical capabilities to perform well in the military. So uh, my, my uh, research, which I really loved doing was for my dissertation, was testing service members, elite and not so elite service members, so special forces, um, Navy SEALs, uh, and uh, uh, aviators in the Air Force, and numbers of different types of, of service members, uh, um, you know, Marines, uh, at, at very high levels of fitness, and then those are moderate and, and perhaps less levels of fitness, and see how they responded to a, uh, an environment that was simulated to be an operational setting. So you, obviously you can't do a randomized study in a, in a war zone. That would be unethical. But what you can do is that you can uh, simulate what a war zone or a combat, a combat situation might look like and then study how the warfighter community and other communities will respond to uh, conditions. Uh, and what I did is I, I, because the body armor was relatively new, it was called interceptor body armor, and everybody was wearing it. 
it, we didn't uh, we didn't really know how that was really affecting the human body under under wartime conditions. So I characterized how the body armor would affect the human body under simulated technical conditions, which made me think and get into not only really understanding the human body and physiology of the human body, oxygen consumption, energy needs, all those physiologic components, but also how to inform policy. So that was why I brought this all up about mentoring, because you never know where your career is going to go. And the, the military has a lot of rules, and it's just like some rules are, are governed by best practices or best thinking and perhaps not really sound ev- evidentiary practices. So my goal was to inform training and fitness and level of fitness that will help commanders, policymakers to understand what degree of performance is necessary when we are putting our beloved service members into harm's way where we can make reasonable decisions both at the command level but also at the policy level that are going to mitigate risks for for service members because as a nurse which I love about nursing we're all, and we are we own prevention in my opinion absolutely that, that's that's what we do so my thinking behind this is how can I assure commanders and policymakers when they put regulations and policy in place that they are putting the right policies in place that won't put service members, soldiers, Marines, airmen, Navy, you know, seamen at risk when they go into it. And commanders loved it. Chief of staff of the army line loved it. Commandant of the Marine Corps loved it. So I was briefing all these high level generals and admirals And that's how I got into policy. I said, you know what? I could translate some of my research to help them to put out regs around fitness, policy, what levels of fitness are necessary. And that took me to another level in my career around mentoring and learning more from service members who were commanders, who were leaders of of women and men, who had to make very difficult decisions to put men and women into harm's way. And, you know, how do they prepare and train women and men to go into harm's way, which is scary, Ali. I mean, when you think about it, that's a scary, hard decision to make. Very scary. Very scary, yeah. Uh, You're you're putting people into the palm of your hands and saying, you know, I care for you and I I need to do what's best. So not to put you on the spot, but, uh, you know, you brought some, you know, with what's going on right now with COVID-19 and the changes in PPEs and the lack of equipment, looking at it from a military perspective of how we train and equip our service members and how administrations or management are equipping equipping uh, our nurses in order to go and take care of these COVID-19 patients. Uh, what's your thoughts around that? Well, my first thought is the, the healthcare professionals, the nurses, the physicians, the respiratory therapists, the first responders, they are heroes. You know, my first thought is they are putting their life out there, perhaps many times without full protection to serve the public. And what a noble thing to do. What a wonderful thing to do. However, I feel as a citizen of this great country, responsible for putting him in that way. So on one hand, I, I'm conflicted. On one hand, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not conflicted about how much I appreciate them and how much I honor them and how much I, you know, I find and I'm in awe and admire them. But I'm, I'm conflicted that I let them down that I haven't done my job as a healthcare professional, uh, perhaps as someone who understands public health like I do, as someone who is a leader in nursing and in, and, in, in the world of healthcare, that I missed something. And my you know, fellow leaders have missed the boat on this. And I'm very upset about that. You know, I'm angry. Um, you know, but that anger doesn't help them. 
They're still putting themselves at risk. So I feel partly responsible for it. Uh, so when a nurse dies or when a physician dies, I feel like part of me is dying because we as leaders, and this is driven into me with my military background, are responsible for the health and welfare of the communities that we serve as leaders. So we have, and I don't take myself out of that responsibility. There is different degrees of responsibility, you know, but I feel compelled that, you know, I wonder if I could have done more. You know, we all knew that based on public health evidence and what gets prepared for at the state level with disaster plans and at the federal level around disaster planning, that another pandemic was, was imminent. You know, the, the, the fact that we had another pandemic in the world is, you know, it's not a surprise to anyone. You know, uh, pandemics have been coming since the beginning of time. What is a surprise and perhaps troubling, not only perhaps troubling, very troubling, is how unprepared we were. Right. Because I, I know from working in the medical centers and being as part of emergency preparedness committees, we've done pandemic or outbreaks and things like that. We've done the training for it. So the fact that this happened and everybody does not have the supplies it needs was very surprising to me. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it demonstrates the inefficiencies and the lack of having a strand, string, uh, a strong command and control of of a pandemic, which um, you know is the responsibility of the federal government and is the responsibility of state governments to coordinate those efforts. And um, you know, the fact of the matter is, there's been a lot of positive things that have come out of this. Is that citizens have responded. They are uh, demonstrating that they do have a social consciousness, whether it's about taking care of them and their family, people who are at risk in their family. Of course, everyone's at risk. And doing what's the right thing for society by maintaining the uh, physical distances, maintaining proper hygiene, and being smart about you know, having contact with other people. So it's not like we haven't come together and have done uh, you know, the right things. However, the infrastructure, uh, as you said, uh, has troubled me and remains to trouble me. Right. Uh, and uh, so I'm kind of conflicted over that uh, and saddened by it. Absolutely. Yeah, that, feel, that feeling is definitely being true. Uh, it's, uh, it's surprising. You know, I have my former students that still contact me about how they're working and the conditions that they're working on there and the reuse of, you know, uh, I had one of my students say that their facility is downgrading the protection for MRSA patients to, to cut back on the use of PPE. And so stuff like that, that's happening. That's just right. troubling. Well, the concept of scarce resource utilization is very difficult and it requires a lot of ethical discussions which we, uh, we haven't had. You know, we, science and technology, as you know, frequently comes well ahead of the ethical discussions that need to follow. And this is an example of, you know, uh, nurses, physicians, you know, a whole group cadre of, of first responders and healthcare professionals being put into harm's way and having to make some really important ethical decisions and, you know, and I'm not saying as a leader, you can take away all of the decisions that people on, in the field are going to have to make. You can't do that right. because that's, but what you can then do is to train them to adapt and be, uh, as we call in the American dream, which is part of the greatness of America, is that we have, uh, it's the home, home of the free in the land of the brave, allowing individuals to have that freedom and to have the ability to be brave under times where bravery is needed. 
Right. It's like now under COVID. I mean, there's so many brave people. However, they are brave. But at times they didn't necessarily have to be brave. If they would have had the proper equipment, bravery would not have been necessary. Uh, but that's not to take away from their bravery, though. Right. So, uh, and for me, I, mean, I don't know if my message is clear to you and what I'm trying to articulate. I, I mean, for me, what I'm hearing from you is, I mean, nurses taking and, you know, healthcare providers overall taking care of, uh, or anybody in the healthcare industry taking care of uh, infectious patients is brave work to begin with. Yes. The expectation should not be that they do it without the proper equipment. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. And we as leaders need to be responsible for them having the proper equipment. Absolutely. That's our job. Very much agree. We digress from your from your career path a little bit, uh, but I want to get back to your current role uh, now as president of Sigma Theta Tau International. Uh, how did that come to be? And I know you have a, the, the Joy of Nursing campaign that you've, uh, you've brought forth. Uh, can you talk to us a little bit about that? Sure. Um, well, I've always been very interested in governance. So I've been on a number, I started off on, you know, very small boards of directors and learning how to govern and be on boards and what the whole concept of uh, how, you know, running nonprofits. I've never been on a for-profit board, but I've been on a number of nonprofits and I've been involved with professional associations I was the past president of the National Association of Pediatric Nurse Practitioners. Uh, I've been, um, you know, president of, of the National Association of Pediatric Nurse Practitioners Foundation. Um, I've been on the Sigma Board of Directors before I became president. I was the chair of the Building Corporation, which is one of the subsidiary corporations of Sigma. Sigma has three subsidiary corporations. One is the foundation. One is what's called Marketplace, which is where we provide the opportunity for nurses and other healthcare professionals to purchase um, textbooks and uh, all, kinds of, uh, all kinds of different educational and learning products, as well as connecting with other nurses worldwide to help to uh, either both either translate science or do c- or conduct research to um, bring science to light. And then the third is uh, the building corporation, which, is, which provides a, a fixed facility. If you haven't been there in Indianapolis, we have a lovely building which provides the fixed facility for the 94 employees and the CEO of Sigma to work. It's a very wonderful place, pleasant place, and uh, what I consider to be a Class A building. Right. So I'm going to take that as an invitation. So Yeah, <laughs> you're, you're welcome to come. Um, so, in fact, the meeting that uh, I'll be president and uh, I will be um, over will be in Indianapolis in, nine, in, 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 in 2021. So you have my personal invitation to come in 2021 to Indianapolis, and I'll give you a private tour of, of the headquarters. So um, just sort of evolutionary and having mentors on boards and working with boards and doing a self-study on governance, um, it was an evolutionary process to move from different positions on a board, like treasurer. I I am a numbers guy, so I have a math background. So I typically um, start off on a board as a treasurer. I get to really understand, you know, the the finances of the corporation, how the corporation runs. And that gives me the background to move into other positions like president. So um, I was lucky enough to, you know, be elected um, you know, uh, as president, and I'm very humbled by that and honored to do it. And, you know, when you're elected as president, you have an opportunity to set the tone for the biennium, the two years that you serve as president. And something that's always been of interest to me and also troubled me is the fact that over my 40 year career, I've seen how much more complex healthcare has become. And how much more nurses need to know, physicians, nurses, all healthcare professions, really need to get in their brain and know that is different from when I started 40 years ago. There's many, many more inputs, you know, that are going through both from the evidence and the technology side and the care delivery side 
and, and maintaining and keeping up with the science, with artificial intelligence and all that's going on in terms of uh, what's happening in technology, it, it's mind-blowing. So it, those are not, with my study and understanding of human performance and how the human body responds to both physiologic and psychological stresses, it, it, I always thought one way to mitigate that is to bring us back to a place where we can be joyful and, and be able to have the creativity. The, ov- the overall arching purpose for me of infusing joy and telling you a little bit more about what the call to action is, the overarching purpose is, is that I want people to be in a place where they could be creative because the only way that we are going to solve the wicked problems that we have in healthcare delivery, not only in the U.S., which is a very complex, fractured, broken healthcare system, but globally, is to have a sense of joy and not be complacent or, or um, lose your sense of, of being in the game and just being on a status quo. I'm delivering care. I'm a nurse. I go to where I work every day. I do what I do. And I come home. That's not going to get us there, Ali. We need nurses who are futuristic thinkers, who are in the game and are creative in, in, in helping us to be problem solvers. And I think one way, you know, this is not the only way, one way to get us there is to capture the joy in what we do and maintain us. And I have three levels of that, which I thought through and I have a framework for it, which it's the ABCs of infusing joy. The first is awareness. It's about understanding where you are in your professional career and your life uh, and knowing what you need to be successful in meeting the demands of your job and finding out a way to have mastery of your craft. Because you, I mean, you can understand this, Ali. If you're not fully prepared and really believe you have the skills to do what you need to do, you're not going to be happy in doing what you're doing, you know. But once you have the skills and the mastery and you feel like you have the autonomy and independence to make decisions, you go home at the end of the day and you say, you know what, I did this, whether you're an administrator, whether you're a nurse providing direct care, whether you're an academician, whether you're someone who's a researcher, whether you're like, you know, a combination of that and informing policy or engaging in policy, you feel like you've made a difference. And making a difference brings joy. And I think you hit the, that point that 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 point really clearly about the mastery piece, and that takes work. It takes work. It takes work, and I think a lot of people don't take into account how they get to that point, and that's where the mentorship or the guidance really comes in handy. Right. Absolutely. And that's where professional organizations and other places. Because I'm a mentor with ANA, I'm a, with the American Nurses Association, I have a mentor. I have a mentor from the American Association of Nurse Practitioners, I also mentor. And then I have mentors through Sigma. So I try to, as I get older, and people come to me like you, Ali, and, and think that I have something to say that's worthwhile for other people to hear, you know, I, I have a sense of gratitude for that. And it helps me to get through and, and restores me because I'm very you know, I'm, I have a sense of gratitude that you reached out to me and you, you, you want to hear more about what I have to say. And maybe in some way, what I say might help someone. Maybe it won't, but maybe it will. But, you know, that, that's where I'm at in my career, you know, uh, at this point at where I'm doing, you know, and what I'm doing. So I feel compelled to do that. So the second is balance and purpose. Balance and purpose is about moving out of your of your professional venue to your to your life and looking at yourself as a nurse who has a career but also has a life and how can i restore balance in that life how do how do how do i keep myself healthy and aware what do i need to maintain some perspectives and you know whether it's through yoga whether it's through meditation whether it's through having a gratitude journal, whether, you know, it's being whatever is works for you to provide you with a sense of calmness 
and allows you to reflect and have balance. And that's where the purpose part is so important. We, everyone has their North Star, Ali. I mean, you got into doing this podcast. That's part of your North Star. It's part of your purpose. Uh, but every individual has a purpose. And everyone's purpose is unique. And having that balance helps you to reflect and really get a, a handle around what your purpose is. And once you have a purpose, man, there's nothing stopping you. You know, once you have clarity on your purpose and where you are and what really, you know, gets to your heart and your brain and makes you want to drive, whether, you know, it's it's something within your professional and what you're doing in terms of wherever you're at, you know, with your career, wherever you're at with what you feel is whether it's a social issue or, or a nursing issue, but these are all, it's all a part of wellness, and how that fits. So, and of course, my other piece around purpose is it changes. Your purpose at 16 may not be your purpose at 21. Exactly. may not be your purpose at 30. And that's a good thing. And that's what keeps me energized. You know, it keeps me from growing old because old is a state of mind. Right. My you know, and if you, disagrees with me, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, obviously, you have physical limitations as you get older. You have, you know, muscle atrophy, you know, but, but the, keeping it going, there's no limits. And then the third piece, and all three of these pieces are going on simultaneously. Not one is any more important than the other, but they all three have to happen for me to think that we really are going to infuse joy. The third is a systems level and thinking about how we can create or co-create. The C stands for co-creation. How can we co-create an environment that allows for joy to flourish? And that's all about developing a culture within the environment that you are engaged in at whatever level, at an interprofessional level. Because we know, particularly in healthcare, that nurses are the uh, you know are the are the largest workforce, and we we have to be involved in movements within healthcare for those movements to be successful. However, nursing alone can't make a movement happen within healthcare. We need our colleagues in medicine and surgery and our our physical therapy colleagues and all the the key stakeholders within healthcare that are part of our team, have to co-create that shared mental environment that allows for um, joy to infuse. This means that leaders need to be involved, the C-suite in corporations, the C-suite in hospital systems, as well as the individuals that are at the the point of care have to come to, to agreement on what that might look like. And then that has to be supported both financially, but with all the resources that we can to to provide a a co-created environment where we can flourish and be successful in solving these most challenging problems, these wicked problems that we have in healthcare, particularly, you know, globally, but in the U.S. where we can't even decide whether we want to have universal healthcare or not. Right. When we know, and, and this is me speaking, okay, not Sigma, not any organization, where we know that in the end, the U.S. is going to have to decide that we are going to have to have universal health care. How we sort that out and what that universal health care looks like, I'm not saying that you know I'm adhering to whether it's a single-payer system, whether it's a privatized system, whether it's a government system. You know, there's lots of great ideas we can draw on from other countries. What I am saying is that we do have to, we do have to decide. The answer, my answer to the question, does every citizen in the United States deserve health care? And my answer to that question is unresolving yes. Absolutely. Yes. I agree. So that's, so in order to get there, we have to be creative. And in order to be creative, we have to have an environment that allows us to have the adaptability, the flexibility, and the joyfulness so that we can move away from complacency 
and move into a spirit of, of innovation and embracing innovation. Well, thank you so much. Um, so as uh, I appreciate your thoughts on, on that piece. So Sigma has been, um, is, is a rather large organization. Um, how, how would you say your message, uh, uh, of infusing joy, uh, from a, let's say a chapter level, somebody who's, uh, chapters that are all over, you know, it's an international organization. It's all over the world. Uh, what would be something like if you asked each chapter to do one thing, what would that one thing be? Well, that's a great point. And there is a, I did create a brochure and because, I have, I have a couple of favorite quotes and sayings. Um, one of my favorite quotes at a systems level when I have, when I have my strategy hat on is that um, strategy without action is an hallucination. So the strategy of infusing joy without an action plan is an hallucination. So to, to your comment, I do have a brochure which has a list of kinds of activities and being a clinical person. And one thing that I find that could be very interesting for chapters is that most, that um, most, if not all chapters of Sigma are affiliated with academic, uh, you know, an academic university. Correct. So linking with the clinical health systems and putting together uh, an activity that a chapter could do, with which engaging frontline clinicians and academicians to talk about what's happening and what are some of the gaps are in, uh, you know, between academics and clinical practice and how the chapter can address some of those gaps is one way I think that we can co-create and create joy once we have a, a common uh, sort of model on that. Other things is chapters could help uh, with uh, getting members of the chapter to and get involved with meditation and be involved with meditation if that works for you. Have, you know, gratitude journals where you sit down and think about what you're grateful for that day. All of these have evidence to support that it helps you to be a more joyful person if you have a gratitude journal. Also, I've been asked, and I do believe that this has resonated with chapters because um, many chapters have asked me to present at their chapter meetings globally. And uh, some chapters have actually had their annual tr- conferences, and the focus of the, of the conference has been on infusing joy. So they bring in speakers and different individuals to talk about how we could address certain things that cause people to be stressful or that have impact on what a joyful practice could look like, whether they're administrative burdens or clinical burdens or payment burdens, uh, whether, like I said, whether you're in academia or in clinical practice, how can, you know, how can we talk? We need to talk about these things, but then also develop interventions. And there's many interventions out there that you could practice. So chapters can win. We have many chapters that have practiced mindfulness kinds of activities that have helped. And you can do these, believe it or not, with every challenge like COVID that brings opportunities like video teleconferencing, you know, or other kinds of uh, virtual platforms, um, people are connecting and they're showing they can connect. So we've had virtual mindfulness uh, kinds of activities. We've had virtual opportunities to allow for uh, people to have Q and A's with me and to talk about what's on their mind and how we could uh, bring Sigma and, and things that we're doing at Sigma. For example, uh, one of the things that we've done at Sigma was to reach out to different uh, subject matter experts to help nurses who are struggling with ethical decisions. We had, you know, we've had, we had a, a couple of seminars given by, you know, a very prestigious nurse ethicist to talk about how do we deal with the concept of scarce resources or putting in environments where we don't have the proper PPE? And, you know, how do, how do we respond to that? And, you know, you know and, and how do we address those challenges and look for solutions, but also uh, 
help ourselves to get through this in a way that doesn't cost us us to have be you know really hanging on a fence you know um and we've provided other opportunities of you know where we have something that's coming up next tuesday is a seminar for undergraduate students who are graduating and talking about what it's going to be like for them to graduate moving into a health in the u.s but globally an environment where the number one agenda right now is COVID-19 and as a new student, that's a different place to be coming to as a new student, you know, coming into a healthcare marketplace that is really focused on COVID and pandemics. So how do you adjust to that? And what does that mean? So trying to fill a gap and provide a need to instill a, a joyful experience, but yet meeting people where they're at. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I, uh, the, a lot of good uh, sort of uh, pearls of wisdom uh, that you've shared with us, and I greatly appreciate your time. Uh, anything else you want to share with uh, with the audience? Yeah, I'll leave you with one more uh, of my favorite things to think about that stimulates me is uh, don't limit your challenges. Challenge your limits. So in healthcare where there are many, many challenges, but don't, don't limit those challenges. You know, don't limit your challenges. Embrace the challenges, but challenge your own limits. Challenge what you think you can do. That's what mentors are going to help you with. Don't shortchange yourself. Um, I, I had, well, take us quickly and briefly back to the military. I had a first sergeant during, you know, when he was a master fitness trainer. And we'd be out doing physical training at oh, dark 30 in the morning. And he'd say, he'd say, don't cheat yourself. You know? <laughs> he'd have us out doing PT. And what he was saying is, challenge your limits. You know, whether it's physically, whether it's uh, intellectually. Uh, and one thing I've learned, you know, I didn't become, you know, I was, many things that I've become was not because, and quite not because I was born with these leadership characteristics or qualities. I've learned them and I've made mistakes along the way. And learning from those mistakes is a sign of challenging your limits and then moving to the next level, embracing what that next level might be. And, um, and having confidence in yourself. So I think that's what mentors bring. They don't tell you what to do. Mentor doesn't tell you what to do, but they help, you to find from within yourself your purpose and your drive. And then you're on your own somewhat to put it, to, to embrace that and, and to be courageous in embracing that and challenging your limits. So I've lived by that mantra a little bit uh, over the years and, uh, you know, and I think that is probably a, a, good, uh, uh, a good expression, you know, for the mentee-mentor relationship. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Again, I appreciate your time. Uh, we have been talking to Dr. Richard Ricciardi, the current president of Sigma Theta Tau International. Uh, great to have you on the show, and we'll, hopefully we'll see you again. Thanks, Ali. Pleasure to be with you. Great. Thank you. You've been listening to the RN Mentor with your host, Ali Taya. Please don't forget to visit www.aliartayeb.com. That's www.aliartayeb.com for podcast notes and resources. And don't forget to subscribe. Until next time, I wish you fair winds and following seas.